Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com. It is the first day of September 2022, and it's time for the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion, another jam-packed information session for you. And the title card there, it's not just a very popular Green Day song from back in the day. The point, after all these other tabs that I'm going to show you, what will things be like out there? This is the first. What is it going to be like when September ends? Where will we be? And I've been talking about this the last few days on these updates that I think there's the opportunity for things to change and we have a bigger impact season than where we have been, which has basically been zero. So any impact is going to certainly seem big at this point, but I think there is still the potential for it to be fairly big overall, but we'll see. So that's the point here. When September ends, let's see what it's like 29 days from now. Uh, well, no, isn't that weird how that works? You can almost look into the future just a little bit and kind of think about it. And when we're at the end of the month, where will we be when September ends? So let's get on with it. First of all, this fantastic map that our man in Bermuda Howard put together for us. This is where we started, so to speak, climatologically speaking, way back in the first part of the hurricane season. All of your points of origin for June 1st through the 10th, most of it confined to the western part of the Atlantic Basin, and then in the eastern Pacific, that is typically what it looks like from 1851 through last season. And then let's just take that off and then fast forward to today. Whew, that's what it should look like. Luckily, it doesn't look like that in reality with hundreds of hurricanes out there. But over time, you add them all up from 1851 until last year, and that's what the points of origin looks like. And we'll have to add one uh, right up here somewhere in this vicinity for this year when it's all said and done that's where Danielle is roughly somewhere in that circle um, and we've had others in the past just so you know this one right here that was in 1952 yes Howard made these mouse overable there's a verb for you and this one was 1898 all those satellite pictures way back in 1898 yeah you bet just kidding we didn't have that we had ship reports though uh, but yes, September typically is very busy and it is approaching the peak time. Uh, even though, and I saw an interesting tweet today, even though we're halfway through the season on the calendar, it is six months long, June, July, August, 90 days out of the 180, it's actually 183, but whatever. We're only about a third of the way through the season on a climatological scale because the two don't line up. There's a lag between the way the ocean warms up and the atmosphere normally gets itself ready so that the climatological peak does not line up perfectly with the calendar. That's just the way nature is. And then sometimes nature is even more goofy like what we've seen this year. Really throwing everybody a curveball that tries to forecast this stuff. But it just goes to show you that, yes, September can be quite busy. So we'll reference this again in about 10 days Huge, huge appreciation to Howard in Bermuda, whom I got to see and meet in person just a few weeks ago, for those of you that care. I care because it was a nice meeting with that gentleman uh, from Bermuda. Luckily, Bermuda probably won't have to deal with anything anytime soon. This is 91L, been bumped down just a little bit in its development prospects. I think we've been talking about 91L for too long. It reminds me of 99L back in September late August, September of 2016. That went on to become Hermine, of course. But anyway, this is still lurking out there. There's Danielle. We'll take a look at this more in just a moment. And then this, I think, is 94L, even though it is way down now at 20% chance of development. Lots of just rather negative conditions out here. Still too much dry air and just other factors. We've talked about that the last couple of days. Those are not relenting yet, but... They might. We'll see. Um, so let's move on to the satellite animation. I really like this one. Dr. Cowan has done such a great job with tropical tidbits. The true color look to it, ah, it's just beautiful. Uh, here's a system in the eastern Pacific well on its way to becoming a tropical storm eventually. By the way, our man Brent down here in Cabo San Lucas, he sent me some pictures yesterday. He said, and I quote, you would love it here. Lots of dry riverbeds and uh, a very desert feeling to it with beaches all around. And he's referring to what might happen with this. 
trying to lure me out of Southeast North Carolina if this does, in fact, track up this way. Yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll get there. But anyway, Brent's down there for a wedding this weekend, and um, you don't have to worry about this system off of the Baja too much. It might bring a few random showers uh, by the area, but nothing that you can't handle, especially Brent uh, with all that he's been through. Uh, elsewhere, a little bit of deep convection eh, from time to time in the Northwest Caribbean Sea, but a, a lot of it is collapsing. I mean, look right there. You can see a little outflow boundary. That is air that is spreading out down at the surface, and that's not conducive for development. Hurricanes need air coming in or converging at the surface. And then again, there's this system down here that we will be watching very closely in the Gulf of Tawanapec there. Uh, a very conducive area for the air to just kind of pile up. And there it is. It's piling up. That is Danielle. We're going to take a close-up look at that in just a moment. A very small tropical storm, but there it is nevertheless. And here is our Enigma out here, our 91L. Boy, I tell you what, as I go through and I show you a, a tweet thread, wow, stuff is starting to get interesting again, even though we don't have anything threatening land, which is a great thing. I mean, look, I want to make this real clear. Just a small, I don't know, soapbox moment, whatever, commentary. I make my living off of tracking hurricanes. That is no secret. This is what I've done for 30 years, various different ways that I've earned an income through awareness projects, award-winning multimedia designs, maps, uh, documentaries that I have produced, that I have participated in, working with different media companies, big companies such as Lowe's and Sprint over the years, you name it, and lots of different ways to do it. We're in the age now where everything is basically supported through crowdfunding and through social media. All of that being said, of course I have empathy for what people go through. I live on the coast. I know how bad these things can be. And I just heard from one of our supporters, one of our patrons down in Louisiana, uh, just after the one-year anniversary of Ida, giving us an update over on our Discord channel. Things are still slow. People are still suffering. People are still dealing with the aftermath of hurricanes from years ago. It lingers. It really does. So I just want you to know, I get it. When we talk about these things, and there might sound like there's a little bit of excitement or eager anticipation. It's more for the mystery and the intrigue of what's going on because we don't have computer models that tell us exactly what's going to happen 10 days out. If we had that and it was perfect every time with track and intensity, I think it would be less exciting, so to speak. There would be the intrigue part removed and it would just be, here's a system, here it comes, and everything would just be straight on preparedness, here we go. So just don't ever mistake any type of uh, elevated energy and excitement as being sort of non-empathetic towards the people along the coastline. I have made a lot of good friends over the years because of people who have been impacted by hurricanes, and we're all in it together. The weather connects all of us one way or the other. So just wanted to put that out there, all right, as I talk about this. Don't think that it means that I don't care, because I really do, and I think what we do here makes a big difference. All right, off the commentary part, back to where we are. Yes, I'm going to show you a string of tweets soon that really does start to shake things up. All right, all right, let's move on. Vorticity signature, let's expand that a little bit. Uh, there's 91L down there, still a large area of energy trying to coalesce. There's the piece of energy in the Gulf of Tawanapec, or at least south of there. And this is our developing system well to the south of the wedding party for Brent's family in Cabo. There's Danielle and there's 94L. I believe that's what that is. Uh, I think we're up to 94 now. Um, it's got a pretty good signature to it, but a, uh, certainly a lack of deep thunderstorms uh, preventing that from really starting to take off. All right, uh, Danielle. Wow, look at this. Nice high-res zoomed-in shot. Uh, some deeper thunderstorms erupting there, wrapping around the center. Somewhat of an eye trying to develop in here. Now, look, this is not your typical southern latitude tropical storm, almost hurricane. It's going to be a hurricane and probably a fairly intense one. The convection of the thunderstorms is a little bit more shallow. They're not quite as tall in the atmosphere. You just can't get that at the high latitudes. But the overall background state is favorable. The instability is there. Um, the warm water temperatures underneath, it's got the really tight spiral banding going on, and some deeper thunderstorms. In fact, some of them, a little bit of bubbling action right there, a little bit more over here, 
almost looks like some overshooting tops. But this is not the same exact look or just overall characteristic to this as you would see if it was down at, say, 24 degrees north latitude or 17 degrees north latitude. It's way up there between 38, there's 38 north right there, and 39 north latitude. That's way up there, way north. But there are certainly very warm water temperatures lurking underneath, and that is allowing this to do what it's doing. And uh, we can see that on the track map here. In perspective, uh, this map produced by our friend Will Woodgate over in the United Kingdom. I love showing this off because it's just spectacular the way we can zoom in and do all kinds of things with it. Um, this is the next several days. It looks like Danielle is going to mill around a little bit and then eventually move off to the north and east. I think it's going to be stronger than a Cat 1. It just looks like it in the modeling and just the overall. The way things have been going, it won't surprise me if this makes it to, you know, 110, 120 miles per hour before all is said and done. Now, I want to add something. None of that wind speed information will ever be verified. So just to let you know, I mean, unless they have some secret mission planned from like the Azores or, or Newfoundland or something for a hurricane hunter to fly out there, which I don't think they will. You, you never know. But it's all going to be based on satellite estimates with a very... Um, objective way of looking at things and they do they call it objective guidance and so these wind speeds that we're going to see are all going to be estimates from satellite in the presentation what does Danielle look like in relation to past storms and hurricanes that we knew were of similar intensity and then other complicated factors uh, I'm on record of saying that this will reach at least category two if not stronger I just think the overall pattern supports it and it, it, it's an anomaly already, so why not just go all the way to the top, so to speak, and be one of the strongest this far north? That wouldn't shock me at all. And this is the reason why. So it is about 38 north and almost 50 west or so. So it is sitting right in this area in here generally. And yes, the water temperatures are warm enough. 27 Celsius, almost you know the 26 Celsius isotherms up here. We're talking 80, 81 degrees Fahrenheit. So yes, it definitely has warm enough water temperatures to work with over the coming days. And we'll see as it, as it does its thing uh, up here and it mills around across the North Atlantic, does it take some of this heat out? We will be watching that closely in the coming days because I think that could have, as I mentioned yesterday, implications drawing some of the heat out up here may change the balance a little bit because boy, it is certainly warm enough in the deep tropics. There's just a weird imbalance with the thermodynamics and other factors going on that this might start to help to tip back into the favor of more activity in the deep tropics. We'll see. Maybe I'm wrong, and if I am wrong, maybe we'll figure it out later and we'll talk about it. That's fine with me. It's okay to be wrong in science. It really is, just so you know. All right, I've never met the gent, but James Reynolds, a friend to a lot of people over on Twitter and YouTube, um, I just want to mention his Twitter here because he's a family guy like me, got a wife and kids. And uh, again, I've never met him, but he seems like a really interesting gentleman. And he is over in the Miyake area, uh, as he says. Here, I'll show you this on our Miyako. Sorry, Miyake? I don't know what that is. Miyako. Miyakojima, I think is what it's called. I'll show you on a map in a moment. This is his tweet from earlier today. Kind of a mammatus looking sky, as he calls it there, the large... Um, well, angry sky with large lumbering swells in the distance there. And he certainly knows how to shoot video, too. No vertical video coming from James Reynolds, that's for sure. Where is he and why is he out there? First of all, I think he's from the Tokyo area, if I'm not mistaken. And he is down here. And let's zoom in on this. This is important. This is where our typhoon is. Uh, it's kind of disheveled right now. Uh, but, yeah, he's at Miyakojima, if I am not mistaken. Uh, I think I'm right about this. When he said Miyako, I'm assuming that's what this means. And our typhoon is lumbering around down here. And it could pass very close to that area. As we can see here, this is the GFS. And we run this out in time. Uh, by the way, James is, again, presumably right there where I've put the blue dot. We run this out. And look what happens. The typhoon strengthens. And it comes very close to the resolution on this particular map. is not good enough for me to zoom in and show you. 
but it comes close to that area and then moves into the areas east of China, still deepening perhaps, and then moving up towards the Korean Peninsula. And then um, Hinnom Nor, or however you call it, will insert itself into the global circulation. Don't you hate it when they do that? Well, sometimes, yes, because they can cause problems. But, boy, you take all of that energy and heat out of the tropics and you insert it into the northern hemisphere global circulation pattern and all sorts of interesting things can happen. And that helps me segue very nicely to this incredible thread of tweets here. All right? So... I'm going to stay up while I try to read this to you and follow it because this is really interesting. Started off here from Andrew Moore, and I like to point out who, like who these people are. Andrew, uh, meteorologist, works at the intersection of weather, weather, <laughs> weather, and reinsurance risk for Arch Reinsurance. Just so you know, so this is um, somebody who knows generally what they're talking about. Now we'll get rid of me just to focus on these tweets, okay? So, Andrew starts out, as 91L continues to look disheveled, yes it does, with an east-west elongated weak circulation, the question of where it goes long-term is becoming a bit cloudier. Hmm, okay, that should get people's attention. Uh, if 91L starts to develop in the next two to four days or so, and develops a vertically deep vortex, we call that, you know, deepening uh, it's like a, a sailboat that puts a big old spinnaker out there so it can catch more wind versus a little sunfish. Then it will almost certainly move through the weakness in the subtropical high. That's what the GFS shows. Andrew does a great job of kind of annotating that here. I will add to it, and it should go on out if it can become thick in the atmosphere. It has to sort of blow up like a, one of those frogs or whatever. You, you know, you see them where they puff up or a puffer fish or whatever. Um, same kind of thing. If this inflates itself and gets larger and beefier, it feels the steering currents in the atmosphere that would send it between these two areas of high pressure that Andrew has outlined there. So that's something to keep an eye on. But wait, as they say in marketing, there's more. And uh, we continue with that. If it remains weak and shallow vertically, it would be steered further west by modest trade wind flow. And that is what the UK Met shows here. The picture of what happens after that becomes much more murky. Something like the UK Met model could occur with a modest low continuing towards the Bahamas. Seriously, like I thought this was done, and it's not. Uh, and then it just keeps going. Or last night's Euro showed 91L continuing west on a similar track, but largely dissipating because there's just not much in the way of favorable environmental conditions around it. The cause of the dissipation on the Euro last night is a strong upper level trough providing westerly winds, uh, making for quite high wind shear as our system approaches the Turks and Caicos right down here. These upper level winds that would cut across it, no good for 91L and it would decapitate whatever's there. So, you see what I mean? It's murky, it's nuts, but the 12Z Canadian chimes in and it does develop it further, and it's a much more favorable environment. So it just like, it's like, this is crazy. It's like the sequel to the sequel to the sequel of 91L just keeps going. And yes, Andrew has it right. And long story short, 91L will continue to be a headache to forecasters if it remains weak. It could just dissipate, or it could become something more. Long way till we know for sure using the ensembles, plus high, high, uh, high confidence heat wave forecast out west. It appears that there will be enough that there will be troughing from northern Mexico across the southeast through the Bahamas in the seven to ten day period. So there's a good chance that it will continue to deal with a tough environment. Probably so. Uh, but these are ensemble means, and pockets of more favorable shear could exist, even if the pattern pans out largely as shown. And I remind you that is exactly what happened with Michael, and I'm just pointing it out. Michael was largely thought to be, back in 2018, in an area where it wasn't going to do much. Some very prominent, well-educated forecasters said it will be a sheared, late-season mess, mostly east-weighted, maybe 70 knots tops in the Florida panhandle. Didn't turn out that way at all, because it found a favorable area in the pattern that lasted for about three days 
and it was only a small area near Mexico Beach in the Northeast Gulf, and we all know what happened. So I really like the way this pans out here, that we can look at things objectively and not just so deterministically, this is going to happen and that's going to happen and that's the end of it. Nope, not with weather. It is literally very fluid. And then Andy Hazelton chimes in, good thread. Looking at, the, looking at the ensembles, it seems like you either get deepening and a quick hook or dissipation in the Bahamas area. Is not much support for the weenie-ish Canadian idea at this point. Well, that was from earlier, uh, but then, you know, uh, the, the Euro chimes in. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, and then he says, thanks. The one other piece I forgot to mention was that recurving Eastern Pacific typh uh, typhoon, East Pacific system, that is likely to uh, excite the subtropical jet. I'm just It just keeps getting more complicated because that feature coming up here could cur curve into the overall pattern and send some energy out this way. Uh, yeah, you see what I mean? It just gets crazier and crazier. Finally, 43 minutes ago, a somewhat similar pattern and steering here between uh, kind of an agreement between the Canadian and the Euro. And I'll show you that in just a moment. And Andy's just like, oh, now, I'm really curious. I added the uh part. Now, I'm really curious to see the EPS, that's the Ensemble Prediction System, because that's a very new solution. Can't believe we could be dealing with this thing for another 10 days. And then there's my point from earlier. You stick a cattle prod and just all kinds of weird things happen, right? And that's what this typhoon is. It's like a cattle prod into the overall system or a monkey wrench or whatever you want to call it. Wow. Interesting days ahead. All right, so sea surface temperature anomalies. Just wanted to show you this real quick because we've got a lot of heat out here still available, a lot of heat up here in the far north Atlantic. This is what I'll be watching closely. Does that get carved out by Danielle? Because if it does, we could start to change the balance just a little bit. The La Nina going on very strong over here. And positive anomalies, warmer than normal temps down here, where our new Pacific system eventually could be a problem, all right? Getting towards the end here, hang with me. Um, so the e, uh, the Euro, the ECMWF from 12Z today, uh, what's what? There's 91L right there. There's Danielle right there. There's 94L over there. And then over here is the beginnings of what will be that Eastern Pacific system that could prove to be quite interesting over time. So let's move this out. Uh, this is every 24 hours. You know what? Let me just flip it over to the regular three-hour one that Dr. Cowan has provided to us. Uh, it goes far enough out into time, so that'll work nicely. All right, so you remember where everything was? Hopefully you do. Um, let's just move it out to 72 hours. Let's see where all of our players are, shall we? There's 91L, still there. There's our new Pacific system developing. No worries about any of this. There's Danielle, probably a hurricane at that point. By the way, this is just a huge... Uh, mid-latitude storm system well east of the UK, um, not tropical in nature, but a huge wind maker overall over that part of the Northeast Atlantic, just so you know, uh, something interesting to watch. Keeping this on out into time, moving it forward to day four, and then finally 120 hours, day five, and that's where we're going to stop for now, because right, I mean, beyond day five, even beyond day two, I don't know what's going on sometimes, so let's just stop at day five. That is an interesting look now on the Euro 91L, not gone, not dead, and it certainly isn't heading out to sea. Wait till I show you the GFS. There's Danielle, probably a hurricane, racking up the ace points there in the far north Atlantic, disrupting any shipping interest out here. And then there's a potential hurricane, potentially headed towards the Baja. We're going to have to watch that. I'll show you that more in just a moment, zoomed in over there. Real quick, though, let's contrast this to the GFS. Same area of uh, the, the globe, the North Atlantic and vicinity. And look, a very different solution. The GFS really amplifies 91L, as Andrew was talking about. And uh, boom, out it goes uh, into the Atlantic, kind of trying to join up there. This would be Earl, by the way, uh, with Danielle. And uh, whatever, we'll just let that alone, right? We'll see. We'll see what happens. Like, there's no way to know. Like, we don't know the outcome it's just utterly ridiculous. Now, real quick over here, as we wrap things up, in the Eastern Pacific, this one won't be a big problem uh, for the Baja and vicinity, uh, but this one could be. We're going to have to watch this very closely, not just the Baja, but as you can see, it scoots along 
uh, just off the Mexican coast. This run of the Euro keeps it far enough away so that mainland Mexico down here would stay unscathed relatively, uh, if not directly. Does that make sense? Directly unscathed? No impacts to speak of. That's what I should say. But by day six here, yes, this could be a problem for our friends in the Baja. And uh, believe me, Brent is watching this closely. Um, and yes, he has equipment to cover it if need be. Of course he does. Come on. Uh, and then that energy moves across the Gulf of California where, wait for it as they say, uh, let's zoom in on this so we can see it better. Uh, water temperatures in here are well into the 80s. Not so much on the west side of the Baja. That's just the way the currents are down here. But this being the Gulf of California nice and closed off and protected from that Pacific current action where water temperatures are quite cold, not so much in the Gulf of California region. So we're going to watch this very closely. All along here, water temperatures quite warm. We could get a powerful hurricane. I mean, who knows at this point, right? But seriously, we do need to watch this potentially, not just for our friends in Cabo and vicinity, but also for potential southwest U.S. flooding and that energy getting pulled in and eventually doing something weird for what might be something lurking off the southeast coast. Wow, to say that it is all interconnected. And that brings me back to here. If this is what it's like on September 1st, just wait until September ends. When September ends, we shall see. You see how all that works out? I'm trying to bring it all in and end on an interesting note there. Uh, so good song from Green Day, by the way. Um, my son introduced me to Green Day, believe it or not, way back in the day. Anyway, um, so yes, this is how we start here. What will it be like when the month comes to a close? What will we be talking about? Wow, September was wild and crazy, or it was still very disheveled and not much happened. That's the interesting part about this. We don't know, and so we will learn together as time unfolds, all right? All right, as always, thanks for sticking with me. I do appreciate it very, very much. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow morning, of course, with the What's Up in the Tropics segment. And then, you bet, another Hurricane Outlook and discussion tomorrow afternoon. It looks like we will have plenty to discuss. Have a great rest of your Thursday. I'm Mark Suttoth for Hurricane Track. I'll be back with you again tomorrow morning.